next guest is Tom Raftery. I asked Tom what his passion project is. He said he's a podcaster. He doesn't just have one podcast, he actually has two. Um, one is digital supply chain. He said, I was trying to better understand digital supply chain, so I created my own podcast, brought in some of the world, most world-renowned experts. Now I know a bit about supply chain. I thought that's a really genius model um, in order to, to, to learn fast. Um, secondly, he's a podcaster for Climate 21. He said he's hyper-passionate about tackling climate change. And he is going to make a really compelling case to you around the importance of addressing climate change immediately. And contrary to, to some of the other points made from this stage, he's actually saying that we have the technological tools, we just need to bring it to scale. What it takes is the appetite of individuals and the political will and clout of businesses and governments to actually make those necessary transformations. We've heard a very important recurring theme, including from you, um, Alfredo, earlier about this. Can't wait to hear more. Let's welcome Tom to the stage. You've said it all. There's nothing left for me to say. It's <laughs> Thank you so much. Good afternoon, folks. Slides? Oh, there we go. Yeah, sustainability imperative. This is a photograph of my dad. I took this picture on the occasion of his 80th birthday. You can see we were having a party, he was having a great time. I put that up there because I'm very passionate about sustainability, and it's in large part due to my dad, I think. When I was a kid growing up in Cork in Ireland, we used to go to the countryside. He'd bring me to the country every weekend and interact with nature. And consequently, I went on to uh, do biology in university, did postgrad in biological control. And then I got distracted, because I'm very ADD. I got distracted by technology, because it was new and shiny. And I set up a software business, and that progressed and progressed, and now I work for SAP. But the role I have in SAP allows me to combine my two great passions, because I work very much at the nexus of sustainability and technology. And my dad is no longer with us. It's not that he's dead, he is still alive, unfortunately, because he was diagnosed in 2010 with Alzheimer's, and so while he's with us in body, he's no longer with us. And, you know, in a way, Given what's happened in the last couple of years with COVID, maybe it's a better thing because he has no comprehension of the number of people who have died as a result of COVID, and so glass half full. Because of the coverage that COVID has received in the last two and a half years, there's been a lot that's happened in the climate space that you might have missed. And so I'm gonna talk about one or two things there. Last July, the EU passed a law saying that all 27 nations of the EU need to reduce their emissions 55% by 2030. This is legally binding on all 27 nations of the EU. And now if I say 55% in the abstract without context, it's meaningless. So let me put a bit of context around that. It's against our 1990 baseline. And so far, in the last couple of decades, we've actually managed to reduce against that baseline 24%. So we've 31% left to get out by 2030. 2030 is seven and a half years away, 90 months. In 2020, because of the lockdowns, we reduced our emissions 7%. In 2021, they went back up 5%. So we've had a net reduction of 2% despite all the lockdowns. We've got to get down 31% more in the next seven and a half years. The scale of that challenge is beyond most people's comprehension. It will mean enormous systemic changes. And it's not just the EU. The Biden administration have announced that they want to reduce emissions 52% by 2030 against their 2005 baseline, so not quite as ambitious, but still it speaks to a direction of travel. And not just the US, China has said as well they want their emissions to peak 
by 2030, and they want to source 40% of their power from renewables by 2030. And just a couple of weeks ago, Bloomberg reported that they're on track to meet those goals by 2025, which is something that China regularly does. It announces massively ambitious goals and then surpasses them. Other stakeholders in this space, we can talk about, for example, the courts are starting to get involved in climate. We're seeing governments being taken to court by their citizens. It happened in France, it also happened in the Netherlands, it happened in Germany, and the citizens argued that the countries were not doing enough to meet their climate commitments that they, that they agreed to in 2015, and in each case, the governments lost to the citizens, and the, and the governments have been required to do more. Uh, a judge in the US threw out uh, oil and gas leases that had been put out by the at the time, Trump administration, it was grandfathered into the Biden administration. A court case was taken against them to say they hadn't done enough environmental assessment. And so the judge said, yep, that's true. Not enough environmental assessment has been done. These oil and gas leases are taken off the table. So courts are increasingly getting involved, as are boardrooms. There were several, court, you know, several boardroom uh, activist investors who raised um, votes in companies like Chevron and Exxon and Shell to try and get them to change what they're doing in relation to fossil fuels, and they won. In the case of Exxon, they voted three directors onto the board of Exxon who are climate friendly, for example. JP Morgan are having similar issues because they, they, they finance a lot of fossil fuel companies, and so they're having activist investors raise motions at their boardroom level as well. Development banks are starting to get involved. They're starting to now stop funding fossil fuel projects. Uh, American and the Chinese development banks are no longer funding fossil fuel projects. And Wall Street are getting involved. There's this thing called the climate, or sorry, the carbon budget, or the carbon bomb, or the carbon, uh, well, let's call it the carbon budget. And to explain what that is, it's, it's quite straightforward. We have agreed as a planet in Paris in 2015 to limit emissions and to limit warming to either one and a half or worst case scenario, two degrees C. And to get to where we are today, from there to two degrees C, we can calculate how much carbon we need to emit to get to two degrees warming. Turns out it's around a thousand gigatons. Again, in the abstract, it's meaningless until I tell you that the proven reserves of the fossil fuel companies are 3,000 gigatons. And the proven reserves are what the value of these companies is based on. It's what their share price is based on. It's what their loans are based on. Their market capitalization is all based on them taking those 3,000 gigatons out of the ground and pumping it up into the air. So we either allow them to do that and destroy the planet, or we don't, and they write off two-thirds of their value. And so consequently, we're starting to see more regulations come into place. The SEC announced uh, just a couple of weeks ago in their latest proposals that they're going to require public companies to report their climate risk out to scope three on their emissions, and that the reporting will have to be audited. So this is getting serious. The EU has similar legislation on the books which hasn't come out yet. And because of this risk, fossil fuel projects are now seen increasingly as being risky. And so the cost of capital for, uh, excuse the colors on the bar here, but the green one is actually offshore oil. <laughs> and you can see the cost of capital is over 20%. The black one, LNG, over 10%, and the renewables, Cost of capital for renewables, not risky, all under 5%. Uh, Swiss Re, so we're talking insurance companies, we're starting to say we're not covering oil and gas projects anymore. Similarly for the Dutch bank ING, and more and more, this is going to be, be a trend. And the other big stakeholders are you and I. The likes of employers or employees. So for employers, if you're seen to be doing good for climate and have a good sustainability story, you will find it easier to recruit and retain employees. And so there's a cost of recruitment and retention going, goes down. 
And for customers, you'll find that you'll attract and keep better customers as well. So it's, it's a win-win-win for companies. So more and more companies are seeing that if they, have, if they are purpose-led, then they get better employees and they get and keep customers. So because of all this, we're starting to see that the global economy is about to become the climate economy. Every business is going to rea realize that they need to make every single business decision, not just based on the financial implications, but also the climate implications. If we look at a couple of sectors, I don't have much time, but the energy sector, for example, is being radically transformed at the moment. Sheikh Yamani, who some of you might remember, the OPEC oil minister in the 1980s, famously said that the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stone, and similarly, the oil age will end long before we run out of oil. And he's right, because it is ending. But for reasons of economics, not for reasons of climate. It's now cheaper to build new renewable generation than it is to fuel existing fossil fuel plants. Not build new fossil fuel plants, just fuel existing ones. So we're at a crucial time and, and the trends are going, the trends for the, the, the renewable costs are going down all the time. They're getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And it's not just that, but also the cost of storage, lithium ion battery storage, is falling year on year on year as well. And so, and, and the, the energy density of those batteries is increasing. It's gone up three times since 2010. And so we're starting to see huge renewable projects being built out. The Sun Cable project is the largest energy project the world has ever seen. It's being built in the Northern Territories in Australia. It's 22 gigawatts of solar. And if I tell you a gigawatt is roughly the output of a nuclear power plant, it's 22 gigawatts of solar, along with 42 gigawatts of battery storage. And they're using it to power the city of Darwin, but also they're drawing a cable 4,000 kilometers north to power Singapore. And they're doing it because they can, because it's cheap. You couldn't build 22 nuclear power plants there, but you can build 22 gigawatts of solar. It makes financial sense. And if you think that's a big project, and I do, then Kazakhstan, they're building a 45 gigawatt facility using wind and solar and they're using it to generate green hydrogen. And if you think that's big, China's planning to build a 450 gigawatt solar, wind, and battery plant in the middle of the desert, in the Gobi Desert. All because renewables now are cheap, and it can be done. The other thing to keep in mind about fossil fuels is they kill. And I'm not talking about petrol wars, I'm just talking about the pollution. The pollution from burning fossil fuels kills 8.7 million people every year. That's more than COVID. Every year. So we need to get off them, and we need to get off them fast. Transportation is another industry that's being radically disrupted. This is my car. I have a Volkswagen ID4. It's got a range of about 500 kilometers. Unbelievable. The shift to the electrification of transportation is going at an incredible pace. You can see 2022, we're going to have 25 million EVs on the road, and that's the bottom of an S-curve. The problem with EVs today is the manufacturers can't manufacture enough to meet the demand. You try ordering an ID4 today, you're looking at it being delivered next year. And it's not just private transportation. I love this quote from Enrique Peñalosa, who's the former mayor of Bogota, where he says, a developed country is not a place where poor people have cars, it's a place where rich people use public transportation. And that's, I love that sentiment. And because of that, buses are starting to go electric. Uh, Santiago de Chile, I think, has one of the largest electric bus fleets outside of China. Uh, China has, there, there's about 600,000 electric buses in the world, and about 550,000 of them are in China. And it's not just buses, delivery vehicles are starting to go electric as well, uh, trucks are starting to go electric, uh, we see lots of the manufacturers are producing electric trucks now, ferries are starting to go electric, it's a perfect use case, and Maersk, 
are looking at powering their transatlantic container vessels by using methanol, green methanol. So hugely ambitious. Other sectors that are involved in this, we see concrete is starting to look into ways of making concrete using CO2, embedding CO2 into the concrete. At the moment, it, it produces massive emissions. And Cambridge, the University of Cambridge, have developed fossil fuel-free cement. So there's a lot of things happening in that space as well, and it needs to because it's a massive emitter. Steel is also seeing huge transition. The aviation sector is hugely problematic at the moment, but United Airlines have put in an order for 100 fully electric planes from Hart Aerospace. Now, these are 19-seater, so you're not going to go transatlantic in an electric plane anytime soon, but still, it speaks again to a direction of travel. And Airbus are showing their concept of a zero-emission blended wing aircraft. So, wrapping up, last thoughts. We have said that the 2020s is going to be the decade of action, and it really needs to be to get that 55% reduction in emissions. But that 55% is going to be the low-hanging fruit, which means the 2030s are going to have to be the decade of way more action, and the 2040s are going to be the decade of, holy crap, that's a lot of action. I came across this quote from Professor Kevin Anderson, he's a climate professor, and he said, we face an unavoidably radical future. We either reap the radical repercussions of severe climate change, or we pursue radical emissions reductions. Either way, there is no non-radical option. We all need to step up and be climate heroes. Gracias.